knows Danny knows that he is incredibly thoughtful and mature and has a sense of what he needs to investigate next and form thoughtful strategies based upon history and human nature and not just upon science. Those characteristics are what makes Danny the right person to lead lobbying strategy for a science-based organization that is working in the unique niche of forming bridges to coalition for effective bipartisan federal climate legislation. It is because of CCL leaders like Danny that I dedicate so much of my own resources to this work. Please welcome CCL's Vice President of Government Affairs, Dr. Danny Richter. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I think that, that might be my favorite introduction ever, uh, being called unqualified. <laughs> it was great. It was great. Uh, but it's true. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I've just been, I've just learned by doing. Uh, and so I'm excited to be here with you all. Uh, we're going to, we're going to take a, a tour around uh, politics at the moment. Uh, and we're going to, we're going to see what we can, we can do about it. Uh, so <clears throat> here it is, uh, legislative update, building, building bridges in chaotic times. And so uh, first I'll talk about building bridges in a very partisan time. And then for the legislative update, I'll talk about where we are now. Uh, I'll try to look ahead into you know, my very foggy crystal ball, uh, what might be coming. And then I'll highlight what I think CCL should do. And then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A and discussion. But before I begin any of this, let's just take a moment to realize that this is a super chaotic time. And I think that this is very well illustrated by the four Wednesdays that we just lived through in January. On Wednesday, January 6th, the Capitol was attacked. On Wednesday, January 13th, President Trump was impeached for a historic second time. On Wednesday, January 20th, Biden was sworn in as the 46th president of the United States. And on Wednesday, January 27th, Biden uh, signed, in, signed a bunch of executive orders specifically targeted at climate. And so uh, I don't know what's going to happen next Wednesday, but it's probably going to render at least 25% of what I say just completely wrong. And so uh, I just want you to know I'm doing the best I can, uh, but this is, this is just a really hard time. Uh, an extremely chaotic time, and that's that's part of the landscape that we're in. And so let's let's talk a little bit about building bridges in in a partisan time. And I think to start this off, I want to uh, ask Thad to share a video uh, that I think illustrates the how partisan things have become. Uh, so. <laughs> First time I I saw that it was really just a it was just a it really punched me in the gut. It was just a, a very it was the visual. The details were not so important to me. It was just the, the visual. It was visually stunning to me how much these 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 two blobs separated. Uh, and uh, you know I this ended in 2013. I don't know how things are in 2021, but I'm guessing that they haven't gotten any better. 
And so here we are, we're talking about bridges, uh, working towards bipartisan solution and treating people with respect. And after seeing that, you have to say, you know, is it, is it hopeless? And my response to that is that things aren't going to change until someone starts to change them. And the question that I, I ask myself is, uh, is this partisan dynamic, which I would call unhelpful and which I would like to change, is this partisan dynamic easier or harder to break if there already exist places where Republicans and Democrats practice habits of working together and showing each other appreciation and respect? And when I ask myself that question, is it easier or harder to break this dynamic if there already exist places where Republicans and Democrats practice habits of working together and showing each other appreciation and respect? I, I think it's easier. I think it might even be a precondition to already have places demonstrating bipartisanship uh, before we can break this. And so it's a cliche, but uh, we need to be the change we want to see in the world. If we want to see a world where you do have Democrats and Republicans with more lines connecting each other and uh, where there's not such a stark divide, uh, then we need to start manifesting that change now. Uh, and that's not to say that there aren't larger forces than any one of us out there working in the other direction. We could very easily choose to join those forces that drive our politics to extremes. They are in fact all around us. They are, in fact, the normal way of doing politics right now. If you do look at the timing, you really go to, it's up there right now, 1993 is really where it started to divide. And so that's getting pretty close to three decades. Uh, I don't know about you, but I was 10 years old in 1993. And so uh, pretty much my, well, exact the entirety of my adult life and uh, all of my teenage years grew up in a, were spent in a time where you don't have this bipartisan cooperation. And so what is normal for me is, is, uh, is this partisanship. And so I have to constantly question, you know, is this practice, which is normal and everybody does, does that make bipartisanship more likely? Does that make it easier for people with this differing political opinions to see to eye to eye and to humanize each other? Or does it make more, make it more difficult? And so here just, this is one area where I decidedly do not want to be normal. I don't want to buy into the normal way of, of, uh, of division. Uh, I want to be abnormal. I want to work to humanize and to understand those whose politics I disagree with. And of course, we all know how to do this. We all have good relationships with people we disagree with on one point or another, even points that are quite important to us. How to parent on religion, how to engage with our pocket supercomputers when we're actually physically with other people, what is, what is rude or not. What are the squishy rules of the road, like how long to leave your blinker on, whether to turn your blinker on, on at all, uh, and how close to get to a car uh, when you're stopped at a red light, and yes, politics. All of these things, we have relationships with people who have a different view on each of those things, and so we know how to do that. But there's no getting around the fact that today politics is especially difficult. So if we want to be that change that we want to see in the world, we need to be especially intentional about building bridges and especially intentional about identifying those very normal, socially acceptable wedges that we're in the habit of pounding deeper and deeper between us and people we disagree with. Bridge building, especially across political differences, is the revolutionary act. So what is the context we must navigate as we try to build bridges across the yawning political divide today? Well, uh, let me see here. There we go. So now we're gonna go to the legislative update. And in this legislative update, I'm gonna try and focus on what I consider to be six politically relevant groups for our work. And those groups are the Biden administration, Republicans, Democrats, business, environmental groups, and environmental justice. Uh, but before we start discussing any of these groups in detail, uh, let's take a moment to talk about the body that all of these groups are going to have to deal with if they want to affect lasting change, and that is Congress. This Congress, the 117th Congress, is perched 
on the edge, very extremely finely balanced Congress. In, uh, in the Senate, Democrats hold the Senate by one vote. In the House, Democrats also hold the House, but they hold it by only four votes. They can lo afford to lose four Democratic votes before they have to start working with Republicans. So just to try and give a couple of examples of what that might mean, if there is one Democratic senator, sitting Democratic senator who dies or who has a, 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 a scandal and has to resign, uh, at that point, that means that Chuck Schumer has to hand the gavel over to Mitch McConnell. That's how finely divided the Senate is. In the House, that means that the squad could be a blocking minority. If Nancy Pelosi doesn't get the squad on board with whatever it is that she's trying to push, then that means she needs Republican votes to get that piece of legislation over the line. That is how finely divided our Congress is. And in my mind, that underlines just how important it is to work in a bipartisan fashion to get anything done in this Congress. And so what about those other six politically important groups? Where are they at now? Uh, in with the Biden administration, right now we see that President Biden is moving very quickly and he is making climate a top priority. This is fantastic. Uh, those those executive orders that he signed on Wednesday, though, those weren't even the first climate related executive orders that he signed in his week old presidency. He signed on day one an executive order uh, committing us to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. So Biden is moving fast and he's moving quickly and he's prioritizing climate. For Republicans, there is there is a there is an identity crisis going on within the Republican Party, and I would say a viability crisis right now. And I want to focus in particular on funding and uh, just the, the the identity part of this. So, on funding, after the vote uh, to certify the election, you had 147 Republicans who did not vote to certify the election, and very shortly after that, very important funders for the Republican Party, corporate funders either said, we're not going to give money, political donations to those 147 Republicans, or they paused their donations, both to Republicans and to Democrats, to evaluate what was going forward. That same week, one of the largest donors to Republicans, Sheldon Adelson, died. I believe he had donated $500 million to Republican causes in the past decade. And so I think it's a reasonable expectation that his family will continue to donate, but probably not in the same in the same amount of money and given how important funding is to politicians in both parties for primaries and for general elections there's just a fundamental viability problem for those 147 republicans can they mount a modern political campaign if they're not able to draw on those donations from the traditional sources that's a that's a big problem and then you also have this identity problem you have the you have President Trump suggesting at some point forming a new party uh, and just these really raw divides within, within the Republican caucus. And I, I think the take home message for Republicans, I hope you take away from my talk, is it's really uncomfortable being a, a Republican right now. No Republicans are enjoying the ride right now. It is, it is, it is awful. Uh, for Democrats, I'm going to focus for Democrats on climate. And I see three factions of Democrats uh, organized right now. There's a faction of Democrats that on climate would love a carbon price to be the backbone of whatever President Biden does. Uh, those are the people who are going to be most closely aligned with Susan's climate lobby. You have another faction that would prefer regulations or standards to be the primary, the headline piece of that. And then you have another faction of Democrats that would prefer subsidies or incentives. And I, I think that um, for, for Democrats, I think, I think there are very few Democrats who wouldn't vote for one or the other of these if those were the headline piece. But there are also clear, clear differences in what they want to lead with. And so there's a question uh, in terms of how they work with, with Biden, what will, be, what will be the headline policy? On businesses, there's actually a lot of really exciting stuff going on with business right now. Uh, I think that part of what is driving that certainly is Biden taking the presidency and Democrats holding, even if it is narrow, majorities, both the Senate and the House. But you also have to look at what the EU, the European Union, is doing, what Canada is doing. Uh, and what the European Union is doing is they've said they have an existing carbon price 
And they've said that on January 1st of 2023, so two days before the next Congress is actually sworn in, they're going to impose a border adjustment on their on their uh, existing carbon price. And that means that American businesses who want to export to the EU, that's the largest market available to them. The United States is the largest market in the world. EU is the second largest market in the world. So if you're an American company, that is the largest market available to you. And if you want to compete there and there's gonna be a border adjustment, you want to you want the United States Congress to act so that you're at parity, so you don't get you you're not at competitive disadvantage. And then with Canada, this was just announced by Prime Minister Trudeau in uh, December. They're gonna make their existing carbon price 170 Canadian dollars. That's 133 U.S. dollars by 2030. While the EU is the second largest market in the world, Canada is our largest trading partner. So here you have our largest trading partner that is gonna have a huge carbon price by 2030 in just nine years. And that might be catching the eyes of some businesses. On top of that, uh, you have the Chamber of Commerce the day before Biden was announced, putting out a press release saying, we want to see market-based action on climate. Marty Derman, who was the Chamber representative put that out clarified that that includes a cap and trade or a carbon tax were the two policies he highlighted. So the, the Chamber of Commerce, traditionally a huge funder of politics and especially Republican politics is saying, let's have a market-based solution and a cap and trade, a uh, carbon tax, those count. In addition to that, you have the business roundtable last year saying, uh, recommending a carbon price. They wanna see this. Last week, this is on the climate side, you have GM, General Motors, surprising the industry, surprising, I think, everybody, and saying they are going to have emissions-free vehicles by 2035. No more vehicles from GM that produce emissions by 2035. That's a, that's a big deal. You also have the American Petroleum Institute, generally not a favor of action on climate, softening their position on on acting on climate. And they were for market-based policies that they can have, uh, they can produce meaningful emissions reductions across the economy at the lowest societal cost. And they also highlight carbon pricing as an example. So let's not fool ourselves. I don't think that the American Petroleum Institute is all of a sudden gonna be on the hill lobbying for a carbon price, but they might not be opposed. They might now be just sitting on the sidelines. And that is also just enormous. And last on the business side, BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, pushing companies to disclose how they will survive in a world of net zero carbon emissions. That is also to have the world's largest asset manager saying, we need to know what your exposure to this risk is, and you need to tell us if we're going to continue to fund you. These are huge seismic signals that are going through the business community. This is a really big deal. At the same time, you have some environmental groups, not all, but some environmental groups who are actually stepping back from a carbon price. They are starting to put out signals that they really don't want to see this, which is which is a bit bizarre. And so I'm not, you know, I can't speak for them, but my best guess as to why you see this step back is some of them are uh, increasingly uncomfortable with capitalism. And the second reason is, uh, the perspective CCL is in the business of creating political will. We put new pieces on the board. Most environmental groups aren't doing this. They're in the business of finding political will with the pieces that are already on the board. And I think that they've looked at carbon pricing and they've come to the, the conclusion in this country, because most other countries that are, are rich countries already have a carbon price. Uh, in this country, they're looking at the pieces on the board and they say, the political will doesn't exist. There is no way that we can rearrange these pieces uh, to make this work. If I'm right about this, this means that if a carbon price is the primary way, the headline piece of the climate package, then, uh, and it shows there is political viability, then I think that that opposition, that growing unease will, will melt away if I'm right. So we'll see. And with environmental justice, uh, this is, it, uh, systemic racism and combating it, tearing down, that's a priority of the Biden administration. I would characterize the Biden priorities as number one, COVID, number two, the economy. I would put racial justice uh, number three, and I would put climate as number four. I think with those two, it might be the other way around, but I, I think it's, it's, I think it's, I think that's right. 
And so I think that uh, environmental justice groups are going to be at the table. I think the Biden administration will make for sure that they're involved in the climate discussion early. Uh, and so I, I think that that's, that's just going to be the nature of things to come. Now, let's look at what, what is coming at us. And so, again, remember uh, that we're in a chaotic time and uh, probably at least 25% of this will have to be rethought after next Wednesday. But let's, let's go ahead and do it anyway. And so with the Biden administration, uh, they're going to keep on talking about climate. And this is fantastic. This is going to put pressure on Congress. It's going to put pressure on business. It's going to put pressure on other countries. It's going to put pressure on environmental groups. And this is great. We love it. It's a very rare and special thing to be an advocacy group with the president having your issue as one of his top four issues. This is great. Uh, it is still unclear what will be at the heart of Biden's climate agenda. Will it be a price? Will it be subsidies or incentives? Will it be regulations or standards? We don't know. I think the, a couple of things could happen to make it pretty clear that it would be a carbon price, and that would be a bipartisan Senate bill especially if it has three or more Republican senators signed on as original co-sponsors, or a House bill, I think, with over 10, 10 Republicans on it. I think either of those things make it a lock that the a carbon price is the backbone of the Biden climate plan. Uh, looking at Republicans, uh, they're going to continue to have this identity struggle. And again, I just want to emphasize there, there are no elected Republicans who are comfortable right now. They are worried. Their party is in the minority. Uh, the funding is crumbling. Uh, it's just it's just a terrible time. And so just bearing that unease uh, in mind as you perhaps reach out to them, if you're if you have a Republican member of Congress, I think that'll go a long way. For Democrats, um, Democrats are going to be trying to make the most of their slim majority. They'll be looking to make Biden look good. Uh, they'll be looking to pass things through reconciliation. Reconciliation is a procedure. It's how the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare was passed. It's how the Trump tax cuts were passed. It tends to be extremely partisan uh, because it only requires a simple majority in both chambers instead of overcoming the, the filibuster in the Senate. Um, but because their, their majority is so narrow, Democrats are also going to be really working to make sure it's something that everybody in their caucus can be there. And they're gonna making sure that everybody shows up for a vote. Uh, so it's, it, Democrats will be cautious. They'll be looking to make Biden look good and they'll be investigating ways to do things without Republicans. And then here on this slide, I've, I framed it as business versus some environmental groups, because I think that as some environmental groups, again, not all are moving away from carbon pricing, you have businesses moving towards it. In, in a really big way. And so it begs the question, who wins? As some environmental groups vacate this space and as businesses uh, pile in, uh, I, I think that, I think probably business wins. Uh, to the extent that I'm right and there's an anti-capitalist sentiment going on, there, there are basically no anti-capitalists in Congress. Uh, virtually all members of Congress are in favor of capitalism. So that's just not gonna work in Congress. And to the extent that they're worried about political will, uh, again, if they do see this political will, I think that might melt. And the other aspect to this is that they, all these environmental groups were for it before they were against it. And that kind of dynamic makes it really hard to, to really get your feet in and have traction. So uh, in this, to the extent that it is a business versus environmental group dichotomy, I, I think that the business perspective wins here. For environmental justice, uh, I first of all want to be clear, uh, environmental justice movement is diverse. And so it's hazardous to say any one thing and to rep say that it represents the environmental justice movement. I, I don't represent an environmental justice organization. Uh, and so a lot of what I'm about to say, I wouldn't put that much stock in it. But uh, my sense is that environmental justice organizations, with all those caveats, are more interested in regulations than they are in legislation. So I think that they're, what is gonna be most important for them is working with the Biden administration to make sure that the, the regulations that the EPA is writing that bear on their communities are, are done well. I do think that where legislation is moving, I think they're going to want to be at the table. I think they're gonna to want to have their opinion heard early. And my sense is that the Biden administration is it's probably going to do that. 
Um, so that's that's my sense on environmental justice. But again, uh, it's very important that uh, those voices speak for themselves. And then let's talk now about CCL. What do we do? Uh, and first of all, I think we have to highlight right now that we're in what I have been calling our lame duck period. Uh, after the last Congress, the 116th Congress, as with all Congresses, all the bills went away. So all bills need to be reintroduced, which means there is no Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act before the 117th Congress. And that that's awkward. It's our lame duck. So the period between when the last Congress ended and when the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act is reintroduced, we're in an awkward spot. It doesn't mean that we can't do anything. Uh, and we know that Deutsch still wants to introduce with a Republican something very, very similar to what he had in the last Congress. Um, but we also know that co-sponsors are going to have to say they're not automatically going to be co-sponsors again. They need to confirm that. Uh, and the text needs to be updated. There's all these things that need to happen. And so for us, how do we, how do we go through this awkwardness? How do we make it through this chaos? Uh, I, I think that what we want to do is we want to focus on what works, uh, things that are going to be useful in any, in any scenario, skill building, group building, providing updates to important endorse, endorsers, engaging with the media, engaging with members of Congress. All these things are always going to be good, uh, and we can, we can figure it out. So how do we relate to the Biden administration? We want to say thank you, and uh, we would love for a carbon price to be at the center of your climate agenda and make it a carbon fee. So that's our message to the Biden administration. There will be an opportunity to do that uh, via tweet, I believe, in the coming action sheet. So keep an eye out for that. But thank you, Biden, and we would love to see a carbon fee at the heart of your climate agenda. For Republicans, uh, they're going to continue to be looking for their identity. Some of them we know already want strong climate action to be a part of that new identity. And we want to help them do that. We want to accelerate that pre-existing trend. We want to be sensitive to how deeply unpleasant it is to be an elected Republican right now. They have lots of people shouting at them. And you can actually cut through that with our calm, respectful, appreciative style. And we've already heard examples of CCL volunteers having very long conversations, unusually long conversations with their Republican staffers. And in those meetings, the Republican staffers say, you're the only ones not shouting at us right now. So uh, here's a time where uh, speaking calmly, respectfully is actually the, the loudest thing we can do uh, because that's what stands out. And so when we do have those calm, respectful, sometimes long discussions, uh, what we want to highlight are those positive examples of Republicans moving forward on climate to incorporate a proactive climate stance as part of the, the emerging Republican identity. We want to uh, share that with them and accelerate that trend. That's our priority for Republicans. For Democrats, I think we want to uh, really advocate for carbon pricing. We want our message to be carbon pricing is popular. Carbon pricing is supported by businesses and carbon pricing will make Biden look good. It'll make him look good domestically and it'll make him look good internationally. It works, it works quickly and it's durable. Regulations are great. We're not saying anything against regulations. Biden should be regulating as well, but Regulations can be undone by the next administration. We learned that to our pain with the Trump administration. They typically work much slower, especially when compared to the nine months, the nine months that it would take for the fee to take effect after passage of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act and their sector by sector. We want something durable, fast, and disincentivizes over 80% of greenhouse gas emissions at a stroke. That's the percentage, over 80% of emissions would be covered by the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act within nine months of passage. Big deal. It's a good policy. Uh, for businesses, uh, you're, you're going to be looking at local businesses, which is great because local businesses oftentimes are more important to members of Congress than nationally focused businesses or business organizations. We're actually getting really good at interfacing with local businesses. Uh, so even though this is our lame duck, go back to businesses that have already endorsed. Go back to the Chamber of Commerce for your local town, your metro area, your state, 
And what I want you to do is I want you to share with them the news about the National Chamber of Commerce, about the Business Roundtable, about the CEO Climate Dialogues, about the American Petroleum Institute, about BlackRock. Share all this as an update and ask them the question, is there something you can do that is something like this, that expresses how far you, your membership will let you go in supporting a carbon fee or tax especially, and carbon you know, act, action on climate definitely? What can you do in this time that will help things move forward? And, and invite them to think creatively on that. If you do have, uh, and these are again, local businesses and local organizations that I want you to reach out to. If you do have an in uh, with a more national office, please reach out to Kyle Camion, who is our new senior business relations officer in the DC office. He's the one who should be interfacing with uh, national groups. For environmental groups who are moving away from carbon pricing, uh, we wanna push back on that in the media. And I think we wanna push back hard. Those environmental groups that are doing this, they're departing from expert opinion. And I don't, I don't think we should let that go. Uh, it's a bad argument. If you're getting away from what experts say works, you're in, you're in those, those are, that's thin ice. And I think we should point that out in the CCL way. But things that I think we wanna highlight are the speed of implementation, the durability, and the economy-wide uh, view of that. So that's that's what we want to do. Uh, Sabrina, I saw you just raise your hand. Is there something you want to, an update you want to provide here? I guess you wanted me to give you like a time signal. Okay. I did. Thanks. I appreciate that. We're, we're, we're within time. So that's, that's a good moderator there. Uh, for uh, environmental justice, the challenge for CCL, we need, we need to build trust. And building trust is hard and building trust takes time. And I think the way we build trust with environmental justice organizations, local environmental justice organizations, I can't do much at the national level because the focus of EJ is so local. The way to build trust is to show up, to take orders, and not to talk about carbon fee and dividends unless you're asked directly. There are no fast routes to building trust. And uh, I would describe this orientation of showing up, taking orders, and not talking about what you carbon feed and dividend unless actor asked directly. This is a spirit of service, not of advocacy. In our, in our interfaces with local EJ organizations, we should be going in there with a spirit of service and we should be taking off our advocate hats and saving that for other, other arenas. And then finally, I do also wanna highlight uh, what we should be doing is we should be taking care of each other. Politics is not fun right now. This is, it's really, really hard. And CCL has always emphasized the importance of taking care of each other, uh, having a robust group, having a robust support network as we do this really hard work, super important right now. So let's take care of each other. Let's, uh, we've got a lot of other committed advocates who share a lot of our concerns about the climate, a lot of the concerns about what our democracy looks like, and let's just be extra careful to take care of each other moving forward. And so just to conclude, uh, it's a chaotic time. It's been hard to build bridges across the aisle for a long time, but our politics is more likely to regain a spirit of bipartisan cooperation if we, if we take the not normal, the revolutionary step of doing the hard work to humanize people who have politics different than our own. In this presentation, I focused on six politically relevant groups, Biden, Republicans, Democrats, businesses, other environmental groups, and environmental justice groups. The Biden administration is focusing on climate, and that's fantastic. It is extremely uncomfortable to be a Republican right now, but because virtually everyone is screaming at them, we can cut through the cacophony with appreciation and respect, and we want to accelerate the extant trends towards climate action within the Republican Party. For Democrats, they want to make Biden look good, and we want to argue that the thing that makes them look the best is a carbon fee or tax because it's fast, durable, and economy-wide. Business is shifting, and it's our job. It's our job to get that message out, especially to Congress, especially to existing endorsers. Some other environmental groups are shifting away from carbon pricing, but this is not based on expert opinion. When we see this, we want to push back with that expert opinion, which is still heavily in favor of carbon pricing, highlighting that carbon pricing is popular, it's quick, it's durable, it's economy-wide. 
for environmental justice, we need to build trust. And the way to build trust is through service, not through advocacy. And finally, let's be nice to each other. Uh, when everything changes again next Wednesday, and we all have to rethink this, uh, we'll be better off if we've been nice to each other in the, in the meantime. So at this point, I'll stop for my, my remarks and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Danny. So I'm going to ask the first set of questions and then Beth. Um, so I have read all of your questions, both to me and in the everyone. And I highly encourage people to look at the resources that CCL has. Danny does not know everything, even though I know you think he does. So um, for example, the environmental justice um, links Debbie has provided, Mark Mesner has provided business climate leaders. So people are asking very specific questions to you, Danny, like what specific questions should they approach their businesses with? And business leader, business climate leaders really know how to do that. And we also trust that you guys know your businesses and that relationship building is so much more important than what I think Danny or anybody else can tell you because we don't know your relationship with your um, business leaders in your community. Um, so the general question that I'm going to ask you um, that goes from general to specific is I think people do want to get a sense of what CCL headquarters and you are strategizing to work with members of Congress for the reintroduction. I know it's no longer our bill, it's their bill. And I know you said a little bit about, you know, Deutsch and stuff, but I think people would like to know more yeah. in terms of how it's introduced in the, not just in the House, but also in the Senate. For example, who do you think are key um, senators? Like, for example, is Senator Manchin one of the ones that we really need to target? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, so our orientation towards reintroduction and introduction in the in the Senate is we want to we want it to be as quickly as possible and with as, as many people as possible. And so we've provided uh, recommendations to the Deutsch office. Uh, on how to update it. For example, you know, there's there's a missing word here. There's a missing word there. Uh, the dates need to be updated, uh, and allowing the Deutsch Office to to make informed decisions. And of course, we're trying to uh, direct them to Republicans who might be close, uh, sharing with them, you know, promising meetings from that we've had. Uh, those are all things that we're, tr we're trying to do on the Senate side. We continue to work with the, the Coons office, uh, providing similar services, asking how can we be helpful? Are there, is, are there ways that we can provide cover to make it easier for Republicans to take this step? Uh, and then another part of that was uh, the importance of Joe Manchin. Uh, and I would say that, yeah, Joe Manchin is an extremely important senator. So is Kristen Sinema. So is John Tester. So is Lisa Murkowski. So is Mitt Romney, so is Susan Collins. Those six senators, three Democrats, three Republicans, they're the kingmakers. Uh, if they band together and say, this is gonna pass, chances are it'll pass. If they band together and say, this isn't gonna pass, it's not gonna pass. And so uh, for all of those senators, uh, that those the constituents that we have in those states, they're, they're important and we are working to uh, provide those constituents with the support they need. There are, are also, of course, other uh, important senators, as I said, if we can get to three or more uh, Republican senators on a carbon pricing bill, I think that that is the inside track. Uh, we're looking at the Climate Solutions Caucus in particular and those Republican senators and the, the constituents there and trying to provide them with more, more support. So those are some things that we're doing to uh, help advance our agenda and to be strategic about it. Okay, Danny, I have a couple of re uh, questions related to would CCL con uh, consider accepting changes based on certain uh, conditions? So um, yeah. the first one is, would CCL consider accepting what fossil fuel companies and, and consequently Republicans are asking for, eliminating liability for fossil fuel companies? And the second one is, would we support the IECDA if it were, if it were introduced um, in the House and the Senate strictly on partisan lines? Yeah, uh, on the first one, uh, I think that that is not, that's not a part of any bill. And that was most, uh, most frequently brought up by the Climate Leadership Council, but they dropped that provision in their proposal. And so right now, nobody is actually trying to accomplish that. Uh, I, I don't, there's no advocacy organizations, it's not in any bills. And I think that 
I don't think that oil companies are really pushing for that either. I, I haven't been aware of that. And so I don't, I don't think that that's a real issue. Uh, and would CCL support a, a Energy Innovation Act that didn't have any Republicans on it? Uh, context matters hugely. Uh, we haven't made a, a determination one way or the other. I think the way in which it's deter way it's with, in which it is introduced uh, will be important. I think who is introducing it uh, will be important. Um, but uh, and you know, can we make the case that this needs this is still has bipartisan support? Um, so we we haven't made a decision on that either. The context will be hugely important. So there's a number of people who are concerned about whether there really is support for um, carbon fee and dividend. I like your take on it, but I also want to mention that I was very uplifted yesterday by hearing a number of businessmen as well as people, uh, po businessmen, politicians, um, you know, people who are leaning right, center, all kinds of things about jobs. Jobs is so very important. I was so glad to hear that people understood, especially businesses, that carbon fee and dividend meant more jobs. So I hope that that got through to most people. I'm concerned that that didn't because there's a lot of concern in um, at the chat that I was seeing about how how do we frame you know the importance or. or questions to me, importance about um, carbon fee and dividend and why is there such a lack of, I guess people are feeling deflated that there really isn't um, I support for carbon fee and dividend, which I'm actually personally not seeing, but we'd love to hear from you, Danny. Yeah, uh, well, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act finished the last Congress with 86 co-sponsors. Uh, that is by a factor of two, more than a factor of two, the most co-sponsors that any carbon pricing bill has ever gotten. <laughs> so it does it does have a lot of support. Uh, and another thing that you're seeing uh, prior to the original introduction of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, two things. You didn't see really any economic literature that considered 100% dividend as, as something that was, was viable. It was, it was academic uh, and it was optional. And you also saw, you didn't see any papers that really had such an aggressive rate of increase as the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And now, of course, you see both those things with regularity, uh, because how can you be, how can you be a serious researcher and not factor in the carbon pricing bill that has the most support by a factor of two ever? And I also look at the Lobbying Disclosure Act filings of Coke Industries. And what were they lobbying on? We can assume they were lobbying against this. Uh, the only carbon pricing bill that they were lobbying against was the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. So I think I think it's I, and you yeah you also have to look at those three thousand five hundred uh, economists. So I think that what this is this is really a question about audience and where you're looking at who are you looking at where are you getting your cues from from I think that you know there there is an increasing number there. Are, are an increasing number of environmental groups who are putting out negative signals about a carbon price. But if you think about who, who members of Congress listen to, uh, not a lot of the environmental agenda has been accomplished over the past 30 years. And so I, to me, I, I question how effective, effective environmental advocacy has been or the strategies that are, are typically used are. Uh, and I question how much influence that will ultimately have on legislators. Uh, and so, and who do legislators listen to? Well, they listen to themselves. Uh, and so you go back to the, the previous Congress and saying this is the most co-sponsored bill. That's, that, that means something. They listen to business, that means something. They listen to their constituents. And we have people in every single congressional district who have for years been saying, I wanna see this. And so uh, recognizing that members of Congress, just like all of us, pay certain attention to certain groups more than others. CCL strategy has been focused on Congress and trying to figure out what they're seeing. And when you look at what Congress is seeing, I think we're doing extremely well. The general public, there's room for improvement and we want to improve. Uh, but that for us always came after members of Congress and their view. Okay, we're coming up on uh, 150 in just a couple of minutes. So this may be the last uh, set of questions. And again, I'll ask several that are, are closely related. 
Um, here in the Mid-Atlantic, we're, we're always interested in what's happening with Brian Fitzpatrick, uh, who, who has been a co-sponsor in the past and then uh, dropped away. So um, if, if there's any news about him, we'd love to know that. And then, um, and it seems that many Republicans in Congress would like to move away from the far right, but will lack the wherewithal to do it. How can we give them more cover to move back to the center? Yeah, uh, so on Brian Fitzpatrick, uh, first of all, I wanna highlight that, that uh, I'm not gonna share details because that is, that is the, that's up to the constituents of Brian Fitzpatrick to really to really share those details and to own that or, or not share them. And something that we always try to do is to respect your relationships with your members of Congress and the confidentiality thereof. Uh, what I will say is uh, that he won his election by quite a bit. Uh, and so I would suspect that he is, is feeling good and, and secure in his extremely strong environmental record. He is on board with uh, carbon pricing. He did introduce the Market Choice Act. And uh, I think that he's going to be the first person that any Democrat goes to when they're trying to figure out with a carbon price, what, what can we get done that has bipartisan support? Uh, so I think he remains a very important Republican. I think he's a bit more secure in his position than he was, uh, but the details, uh, that's, that's to the, it's to the constituents. Uh, and then the larger question of how, how do we get Republican, could you repeat that, Beth? Uh, how do we get Republicans sure. to be more bold? Right. It seems that many would like to move away from the far right, but sort of feel trapped. Um, and how can we give them more cover to move back to the center? Yeah, all politics is ultimately local. And uh, it may be that the far right does have a lot of sway in, in your district, uh, but it might equally be that they don't. And the member of Congress, your member of Congress is trying to distance themselves from that element of the party because the local dynamics are very clear, they'll lose. If they're clearly identified with, with Trump or with the 147 uh, Republicans who voted not to serve by election, they will lose. And that's, that's, the, that's the importance of, of local politics. And the number one thing I would say is, uh, I would share those, those business announcements that, I, that I, I shared with you as, as widely as you possibly can. Share them with your member. That's probably gonna help them. Share, look up who, who's, who are the business interests? What are the biggest employers in your district? What are the biggest, uh, businesses by revenue? What are, the, what are the business associations in your district, in your state? And share this information with them and see, again, ask them, is there something you could say along these lines uh, that would be on the side of moving quicker? And, and I think that, that that kind of local support is gonna, is gonna be what helps uh, members get to a position where Brian Fitzpatrick is right now, where uh, they can have comfortable majorities, they know their district, their district their constituents know that they are they are representing them on on climate. So uh, that the key is going to be looking for who they need in their district to support them, and not to make the mistake of assuming that all Republicans are alike. Or what the what you see in the national discussion is also going to be true of your your Republican. Um, it, all politics ultimately is local. Okay, thank you, Danny. As usual, we have way more questions than, than we can get to. Um, so we might collect a list of those and forward them to you. Um, and, and if there's anything in future events that you can do to answer some of them, we'd be really grateful. Yeah. But we understand you're, say, you are a busy guy. <laughs> yeah, I'll also say that the forums on CCL Community are a great place to post questions. Uh, we have uh, several staff who are answering those. Uh, some of them uh, will often check in with me when they don't know the answer to a question. Uh, and so that's, that's a way that you can, you can probably get a quicker answer is by going to the forums. Uh, your question might already be there uh, or you're, you're just likely to get a, a quicker answer. So that's another tool uh, resource yeah. that you all have available to you. Yeah, there are often lots of great conversations going on in the forums. So um, need to break now so that everyone has time to uh, take a break and get to your next session, which begin at two o'clock. And there are four workshops going on this afternoon. I've put the links for all of those into the chat. 
Um, there's diversifying your chapter, a braver angels bridging the divide on climate solutions, the En-ROADS workshop, and coastal impacts, which is on this line. So if you're going to that one, you can just stay put. Um, but thanks for joining us, everyone, and uh, we'll see you again soon.